My name is Martin Rowe, and in addition to being a board member for the Culture and Animals Foundation, I am a writer and the publisher at Lantern Books, which has, since 2000, published many books on animal rights, veganism, and social justice. Before that, I worked for five years at the Continuum Publishing Company, which itself published many books on the same subjects, including The Sexual Politics of Meat by Carol J. Adams. In fact, Continuum's legacy on animal advocacy goes back further to when it was joined with Crossroad in the 1980s. At that time, it was something of a pioneer publisher, producing Old MacDonald's Factory Farm by C. David Coates and Christianity and the Rights of Animals by Andrew Lindsay. In 1994, I also founded and edited a monthly magazine called Satya, which covered vegetarianism, environmentalism, animal advocacy and social justice, and recently came out with a 21st anniversary issue. As you might imagine, my profession provided me with many opportunities to work with, interview, and read the writings of many thinkers, activists, and provocateurs within the animal protection movement broadly conceived. One of those was Tom Reagan. I first came across Tom's work when I was studying for a master's degree in religious studies at New York University in the early 1990s. One text that caught my eye was Animal Sacrifices, Religious Perspectives on the Use of Animals in Science, edited by Tom and published by Temple University Press under the editorship of Jane Cullen. I can't remember much of the book over 20 years later, to be honest, except that it introduced me to the writings of Andrew Lindsay and the Indologist Christopher Key Chapel, whom I would interview for Satya. Many years later, I would publish Chris's Sister the primatologist Patricia Wright Chapel, one of the many serendipitous connections and streams of thought that bubbled up from my reading and the connections, both intellectual and personal, that I was fortunate to be exposed to through the work of Tom. One theme I do remember from Animal Sacrifices was that vivisectionists were the priestly caste of today, men endowed with authority and power in our society to place the body of an animal on a table and open it up to uncover the secrets of our existence. It was an insight that felt intuitively as well as socio-politically correct to me, not least in its very suggestive connection to the moral discussions that wend their way through the Hebrew and Christian Bible, as it moves from the efficacy of human sacrifice to animal sacrifice and thence, and this is Lindsay's insight, to the paradigm of the Christological sacrifice that ends all sacrifice and redeems all creation. This notion of a progression through the Bible from slavery to freedom, from human sacrifice to no sacrifice at all, was garnered from Regina Highland, whose book, The Slaughter of Terrified Beasts, I first heard about at a Compassionate Living Festival back in the mid-1990s, and which, at the suggestion of Carol Adams, I republished at Lantern, under the less sanguinary title of God's Covenant with Animals. Again, another connection through CAF. Shortly after, I read another volume edited by Tom Reagan and Andrew Lindsay, Animals and Christianity, A Book of Readings, which proved enormously helpful in giving me primary texts from which I could draw for my master's thesis, which was on animals and nature in the Hebrew and Christian Bible. In my research, I would come across succinct summations of Tom's central thesis as encapsulated in The Case for Animal Rights, in In Defense of Animals, edited by Peter Singer, in The The Generation, Reflections on the Coming Revolution, in Animal Rights, Human Wrongs, and in The Animal Rights Debate, co-written with Carl Cohen. In all of these volumes, and perhaps even more so in Empty Cages, Facing the Challenge of Animal Rights, I was struck by the clarity of Tom's argument and the passion with which it was expressed, as well as the judicious use of irony when it served to debunk some of the more excessive counter-arguments offered. During the 1990s, I found myself a regular attendee at the Compassionate Living Festivals in North Carolina. These intimate gatherings brought scholars, activists and artists together to share their work and passions, and were, in my experience, unique. It was there I first encountered the work of Sue Coe, where I first heard Gary Kowalski, whose first book for Lantern, The Bible According to Noah, grew out of a talk at the festival. 
I vividly recall listening to Harriet Ritvo talk about the rise of pet-keeping among middle-class women in the 18th and early 19th centuries as signalling a change in Western society's relationship with domestic animals, laying the groundwork for animal advocacy in the later 19th century to be associated with middle-class life and women's activism. This insight, which placed animal advocacy in a historical, social, political and gender context, I found very valuable, not because it emphasized animal advocacy as a social justice movement, but because it showed me how essential political, economic and gender analysis is in understanding why social movements do or do not succeed. The Compassionate Living Festivals provided many such instances. I recall Diane Beers' discussion of the humane movement in the US and the UK at one such event. And it is hard to overpraise Tom and Nancy for providing the platform where scholars could communicate with non-academicians on their research. The festival also provided me with an opportunity to be present at the midwivering of human animal studies, which was a natural outcome of Tom and Nancy's recognition that animals are present at the heart of many scholastic disciplines, and that our concern for non-human beings can never be isolated from human self-expression. Since then, I've been fortunate to have published several titles in human animal studies, and to have begun a series at Lantern entitled Biographies, two of which I wrote myself, and the fourth of which will come out this spring. In many ways, although I never consciously intended it so, the biography series reflects much of what I learned and valued from Tom's writings, the thought and thinkers he exposed me to in his anthologies, and with Nancy at the Compassionate Living Festivals, and in the Human Animal Studies work that was a natural outgrowth of the Culture and Animals Foundation, and the love of literature and the arts that is my background. The biography series investigates the lives of individual animals or a species through the lens of the author's personal experience of encountering that animal or animals or species. On one level, the series is biographical in that the books constitute literally writing, graphene, about life, bios. On another level, they seek to disrupt the concept of the magisterial and disinterested academic addressing a philosophical, social or aesthetic phenomenon. As the case of animal rights shows, Tom Reagan was plenty scholarly when he needed to be, and I can understand that he and many other scholars in the 1970s felt it was important to re-tilt the balance toward reason and logic so that our complex relationship with non-human animals wasn't seen as mere, in quotes, sentiment affectation or faddishness. But as Tom's protests, his passionate speech at the National March for Animals in Washington in 1990, and you can see him in this photo holding the banner at the front of the march, his participation in sit-ins and his work Empty Cages illustrate, among countless other expressions of his commitment to animal advocacy, it would be completely wrong to assume that scholarship means indifference or conversely, that a commitment to writing about life, biography, means the eradication of biography. That is the third meaning of the biographies series, that our biographies matter in relation to the animals that we encounter. Indeed, as ethic of care feminism, ecofeminism, and intersectionality have taught us, we are always in relationship with other historical and social conditions, past and present, and our concepts and contexts are always necessarily embodied. Indeed, as Patrice Jones notes in The Oxen at the Intersection, the question that she has resolved to ask herself when confronted with social injustice and her effort to correct it is where's the body? Where is that relational animal being? Where is the body of knowledge or the collected unaddressed assumptions that the body reveals but the mind seeks to pretend not to notice or to argue itself out of noticing? And where in the body is the feeling contained, the unregulated and unregulatable pulse that animates us? This is, naturally, part of our biographies. This also, naturally, leads us on to the final meaning of biographies, and that is the central and profound observation that Tom made all those years ago, that animals also have biographies, that they are subjects of a life, and that their lives matter to them just as our lives matter to us. 
Thus, the biographies series tells the story of those other animals, of the polar bear Cunic in the Toronto Zoo, in the polar bear in the zoo, of a number of different elephants in Elephants in the Room, of Bill and Lou, two oxen in the oxen at the intersection, and now Babe, the pig who jumps from the back of a truck in China, in Alex Lockwood's The Pig in Thin Air. Tom's insight into biography not only leads to an understanding that animals are indeed subjects and not objects, that they are an I and not an it, and that they possess consciousness and their lives have shape and meaning, but that therefore they, like us, have a story, a narrative, a beginning, a middle, and an end. How apt, therefore, that Tom should be one of the people who could echo the discovery of ethologists who decided that animals were best studied not in mazes or boxes or in labs, but in the field, in their context, where they uncovered the personalities of individual animals and showed their stories. How apt as well that the exponential growth in human-animal studies should illustrate how animals are embedded in every aspect of our experience of the world around us, and that far from being a distraction from true scholarship, our relationship with them actually lies at the heart of scholarship. For how else can we understand our story on this planet unless we learn to read creatively, imaginatively, and humbly the biographies of the millions of animals whose lives we've neglected, and worse, for millennia? Tom and Nancy's Culture and Animals Foundation has often been the place where such thinking has been stimulated and supported and such stories have been told. I'll end with just expressing my thanks for two such grantees, Liz Marshall, director of The Ghosts in Our Machine, and Joanne MacArthur, the Canadian photojournalist who is the human subject at the heart of ghosts and the author of a book that Lantham published, We Animals. They will tell what Kath meant to them anon, but I'd like to add my thanks as well. We Animals was a pleasure to work on and be part of. One of those books that any publisher sees as the reason why she or he gets into the business in the first place, to produce something of value, of beauty, and of compelling social importance. A book that provides opportunities for further work. In my case, that was The Polar Bear in the Zoo and the Biography series. The Culture and Animals Foundation was directly responsible for that. So thank you, Tom and Nancy, for all that you've done, for writers, activists, and artists, and for me, Lantern, Satya, Human Animal Studies, and the cause of biographies of all kinds and from all species, including we animals. I'm Mia MacDonald, and I run the New York-based public policy action tank, Brighter Green. I'm also a board member of the Culture and Animals Foundation, and I'm one of those people who remembers when animal rights protesters were derided as little old ladies in tennis shoes. As a tween back in the day, I attended protests with some of those women and men, and I learned a lot from them about effective action and channeling passion toward political ends. I'm pretty sure it was in the context of one of those protests, or afterwards when we'd repair to someone's Manhattan apartment or a coffee shop to warm up or debrief, that I first heard about Tom Reagan and the case for animal rights. I also learned then that Tom, along with Nancy, wasn't just a gifted theorist and writer, but both were real-life activists who attended animal rights protests like the ones I did. I was taken with what seemed like an unusual duality, a modern-day Plato who wasn't in an ivory tower, but was on the streets like us civilian protesters, facing derision and mystification, potentially even transformation. I got to see Tom for the first time live at the March for Animals in Washington, D.C. in June of 1990. I was struck that day by the vast number of people in the state delegations. They just kept coming. It was a surreal and wonderful sight. Who were they all, I wondered. To this day, I still don't quite know. But what was also memorable about that day was Tom's speech that laid out a cogent rationale for the rights of animals in what I recall as visionary as well as practical terms. Did I later on see Tom singing animal liberation songs? I think so. And if it wasn't at the March for the Animals, then certainly I saw him singing at later protests. That singing encapsulates, surprisingly, 
what I admire so much about Tom and Nancy, their embodiment of an unusual combination of rigor and accessibility. Neither has stinted in their commitment to the hard truths of animal rights as a philosophy and a praxis, but at the same time, they've welcomed generations of cross-genre activists, scholars, practitioners, writers, and artists to engage with them through the many years of the Compassionate Living Festivals, the grants of the Culture and Animals Foundation, and also through their presence, open, accessible, earthy, at innumerable conferences and protests over the years. Their work has also informed the vision of Brighter Green, which I launched to bring greater policy attention and action to issues that span the environment, animal rights and welfare, and global development. We're working now to complete a research project on the points of intersection and disconnection between concepts of animal rights and the rights of nature, both philosophical and practical. It's been challenging to bring the project to completion, but it wouldn't have been possible to even embark on it without Tom and Nancy's example. My mentor, the Kenyan environmentalist and Nobel Peace Prize winner Wangari Mathai, wrote this at the end of her autobiography, Unbowed. Those who care deeply for this blue planet continue to be restless. If we really carry the burden, we are driven to action. We cannot tire or give up. In conclusion, I'd like to thank Tom and Nancy for remaining restless and for what they've done and will continue to do for all species on Earth and their future generations.